to the seeker-sensitive movement that says, listen, you can seek after God. It says the wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. Why? Because God is not in any of his thoughts. I mean, were you running around seeking after God? You, uh, you might say, well, at one point I was. Well, the true issue was is that he was seeking you. Well, it's just like Romans 3.11 that says there's none who seeks after God. The one who really is the seeker is God. And so the danger is a pride. It stirs up strife. It stirs up contention. It doesn't seek after God. And it just kind of continues in a downward spiral because it, it leads to the worship of idols. It leads to destruction. It leads to disobedience. Moses said in Deuteronomy 8.19... Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. See, what would lead them to forget the Lord your God and follow after other gods and serve and worship them would be their pride. It would be their pride. Fourth danger, God doesn't tolerate it. In fact, He hates it. Two verses, Psalm 101, verse 5. It says, Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. And the one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. And the second passage is Proverbs 6, verse 16 where he talks about these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. And then he begins to list them. What's he say? A proud look. Well, that does bring some problems, doesn't it? It certainly does. And what do you do about it? I mean, how do you really deal with this in your life? Because God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So how do you deal with this? You've got to humble yourself. I mean, it's just straight out. You've got to humble yourself. It's like Spurgeon said, you could humble yourself or you could be humbled. Which would you choose? I think I would choose humbling myself. See, pride brings with it destruction, and pride itself will be destroyed. So how do you keep from experiencing the destruction of that? Well, again, you have to kill it. You have to mortify. You have to put to death the deeds of your body. You have to fight with it with all your might. And if someone points it out to you, don't get mad at them. Thank them. Thank the Lord that He did that. Don't mount up with pride and fill up your wall of defenses and justify your actions. That's just making it deeper. I was thankful this morning that I confronted myself <laughs> through the radio program. <laughs> I didn't have somebody walk outside and say something to me. How do you deal with it? Here's you a few steps on how to deal with it. Proverbs 30, verse 32 says this, If you have been foolish in exalting yourself, or if you have devised evil, here's a very practical response, put your hand on your mouth. If you're out there boasting, you're out there seeking your own glory, trying to get everybody to look at you, you're trying to get all this attention, and you're doing it verbally, he says, just put your hand over your mouth. Stop speaking. Secondly, confess it as sin. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Recognize that it's sin. And then third, humble yourself. James 4, 10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. So He says, put your hand on your mouth. Confess this as sin. And humble yourself. Repent. That's really 
That's really what these people needed to do in John 8. But they didn't humble themselves. No, they continued to exalt themselves. And they continued to persecute the one who could truly bring about a destruction of this in their life. Who could truly transform their lives. Is there ever any time in your life as a Christian that you resist the Lord? Sure. Maybe that's not what you desire, but there are times when that happens. For whatever reason. But we have to recognize it as sin, and hopefully quickly. We have to be like Joseph when he ran from temptation. He immediately ran. He didn't stand there rationalizing. He didn't stand there justifying his presence in that house alone with Potiphar's wife. When she made those advances on him, he got out of there. The only thing that was to his detriment was the fact that he left one of his garments and that was used against him. And that made her words believable and made his words sound like a lie. Where are you at this morning? How do you compare yourself with this? You say, I believe. I, I'm truly born again. I believe. I've trusted in Christ. I have given Him my heart. I've given Him my life. Praise God then. But do you live in that every day? And well, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I go through the whole day and not even pick up my Bible. Well, again, I think where we, we recognize where we have departed in our true love for Christ, we have to go back there to that place of departure. It's like in Revelation chapter 2 when he told the church at Ephesus they had left their first love and he says to repent, and then he says to repeat. Go back and do the first works. Go back to when your heart was warmed by the things of God, when you were excited about the things of God. Go back to that place of departure. Repent. Beloved, it's, it's the only thing that keeps me going is the Word of God. That is it. That is just plain and simple. I'm not saying that piously at all, but I say in the 22 years or so that I've been preaching and being in the Word... That's the only thing that gives me strength. You know, I'd, I'd love for people to come along and, I mean, I get in my little pity party too, and I'd love sometimes for people to give me a phone call and say, hey, how you doing? And really want to stand there for the answer. <laughs> Jared asked me that last week, and I think I probably shouldn't have said anything because I answered <laughs> And I know we use that sometimes as a greeting, like, hi, how you doing? We're not really interested in how they're doing. We're just, it's like, hello, you know. I remember when as a kid, there was a lady, a family that lived, well, it was a husband and wife, older couple that lived across the street from us, and they had a little store in their front room. And as a little kid, I used to go over there and buy candy, and, oh, she complained about everything. That was the only bad thing about the candy. The candy was great, but the hard part was going over there to get it. Because you had to listen to all that that she shared. And, you know, you're a little guy, 10 years old or so, and you don't understand this, you know. And uh, she probably went to her grave like that. I don't want to be like that. I know you don't want to be like that either. Let's go to the one who can deliver us from that. Father, we just come to you once again, and we thank you for your mercy and grace to us now. And Lord, I just pray that we would realize very quickly when these things happen, when these things rise up, that, Father, real quickly we would repent, we would turn from this. Lord, that we would fall upon your mercy and grace. Lord, I thank you for your forgiveness of my sin. And I thank you that any time that we go to you and pour out our hearts before you, that you're there, that you hear us. And Lord, you bring us back to yourself. Pray for each of us in here, Lord, that 
we all would give our hearts over